Uh, good morning, world. Maria here, alive and kicking. Today we have a wonderful show. We're going to take a break from the crazy world we live in. I have one of the most magnificent children's books writers with me that I have ever, ever read. I also want you to know that after this show, it'll be followed up with Joe Meyer, the economist. We're going to be talking about that. But today I have with me a fabulous uh, children's writer. Uh, and I must tell you, I am so blown away by these books that every parent, every grandparent listening, and every senior out there listening, buy these books for yourselves and the people you love. My guest is Ariane de Bonfaisson. She is the author of the books. She's been everywhere. And I'll tell you what, she's got some great people that love these books, from Goldie Hawn to psychologists to parenting groups. Absolutely fabulous. So I'm very happy to have Ariane with me. Good morning, Ariane. Good morning. So great, and thank you for all your kind words. Well, listen, I don't just say words for any particular reason. It's very rare that something this exciting comes across. Mm -hmm. And I did want to give out uh, the titles of your book. One of them is Giggles and Joys, and Joy, Spiritual Life Lessons for Kids. You Are Loved, Spiritual Life Lessons for Kids. And Being You, Spiritual Life Lessons for Kids. And what I like is that you call these books spiritual, but not for or against any religion. And I love the way it's written because it doesn't offend anybody. Mm, absolutely. And you know what? It was such an important decision for me because, you know, we focus on our children's minds, we focus on their bodies, and then this thing called their spirit, you know, which is not anything to do with religion or anything that, you know, parents have chosen for their families and child, but the, the spirit of the child is what I wanted people to get back to and to sort of Let's focus on what's below the neck, not only what's above the neck. And these little beautiful hearts and souls and spirits, and it's like, how do you nurture that? How, 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 do, you, how do you find words that really go side, and side by side to any religion? You know, so it, it's, it holds every religion's hands. It, that's what I really am trying to say. Right, but it also teaches children so much, not just about their spiritual self, but even their environmental awareness, you know, mm. being part of the world, being part of the world population, uh, how to communicate, how to appreciate nature. Uh, and, and these are the types of things that parents really need. You know, I was telling one of my girlfriends yesterday, I showed her the book because she's a new grandma, and she wanted them. And I said, no way. I said, you buy your own. I said, I'm keeping these for my great-grandchildren. <laughs> I figure my great-grandchildren are due in the next year or two, so I want to hold wow. on to them. Uh, but Amazing. I, but, you know, I think about the kind of storybooks we used to read to our kids. You know, you, you look like a fairly young woman. Uh, but, you know, my kids, you know, I have my children in the 70s. And, uh, you know, what did we have? Grimm's fairy tales and a lot of fairly scary fairy tales to tell children at night. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm with you on that. You know, I haven't... I have a five-year-old, and we have avoided the fairy tales. We've actually avoided a lot of the the traditional, you know, boy meets girl and boy rescues girl and girl looks a certain way, boy looks a certain way because that's not that's not the world. It's not the life that they're going into. And you know, for me, what I wanted to do with these books is to give them a very rich inner life and sort of more of an inner tool belt because these children are going out into a world that's changing. You know, their their parents might stay together, might not. They might move. They might go to new schools. They might, you know, they're going to go through that. And the only thing that remains the same really is what's going to be on the inside. Like, where is their true home inside? How do you how do you build your self love, self kindness, self forgiveness? How do you give them tools like breathing and meditating, but that a four, five, six year old really understands what they're doing when they're breathing? You know, the just even allowing children to sort of, you know, be emotional beings and to have like the full range of emotions that's available to them. It's not, mm -hmm. you know, I think as, as kids grow up, we kind of squash a few emotions out of them like every year. You know, as a baby, mm -hmm. they're allowed every emotion. And then when they're two, right. we call them the terrible twos and we push away like emotions. And, and I, you know, you look at the little bit of the older kids and what they're really screaming for is just to be allowed to feel feel scared, feel happy, feel angry, feel annoyed with the world, feel, 
you know, all these things and be, allow children even to have a bad day. Absolutely. You know, one, of, one of the poems is Bye Bye Bad Day, which is, it is the most normal thing in the world. And I, I'm a big believer in just allowing kids to feel discomfort and disappointment. And when they know that they can, they get through it and there's another day. And, you know, that's when you start feeling the real courage and resilience of the child. Not when the parent or the grandparent saves them. Right. Well, you know, when, when my son was little, God, a long time ago, he's almost 40 now, uh, he, mm -hmm. was, he was very emotional. And uh, I encouraged it. You know, he was very playful. He was a happy kid, always, you know, uh, making people laugh and, you know, but he would cry, you know, if, he, if it was a situation, he would cry. And my husband at the time thought that that was terrible. He didn't see it as manly. You remember people yeah. used to say, boys don't cry, uh, you know, that type of thing. And I recall taking him to my pediatrician and my husband was, you know, basically berating him at the pediatrician saying, this kid cries at the drop of the hat, this and that. Mm. There's something mm. wrong with him. He was only like three years old. And mm. I'll never oh. forget, you know, my pediatrician was a great old Italian doctor. And he looked at my husband and he said, what's wrong with him being emotional? He said, the world could use more emotionally sensitive men. So, so I don't think that was what my husband expected at the time. Uh, but, you know, we have to stop, you know, these old adages of what's right for boys and what's right for girls, especially in a time where bullying is in the forefront of everything now. Of course. You know, I'm, I'm a big believer that, you know, we think we... We don't realize the impact of labels of any kind. You know, this one's funny, this one's sporty, or, right. you know, my son's in a grumpy mood. But even that, like, I, I would never say that about a grown-up. I'd never say, you know, she's in a grumpy mood. Like, so it's, it's really allowing them to have their, their full expression because they'll, they'll come out of it, you know. They don't need to do it on our timing. They don't need to do it, you know, to get our approval, and they certainly don't need to get it to get our love. And I think the more... You know, the more we can parent from free of expectations of this is how my child needs to be so that I feel good as a parent. Mm -hmm. um, you know, someone asked me the other day, well, what do you do when your child is a tantrum in a public place or in a park? And I was like, well, the last thing I think about is what other people think about me, because then I'm really not focused on my state mm -hmm. and my child's emotional state. And most people go immediately to, oh, my God, what are people going to think? Oh, exactly. Meaning you miss a complete connection with your child to actually fully be there. Of course, remove him, take him out of the environment, do what you feel is right. But no one is looking at you, judging you other than yourself, really. Right. And well, for that, you know, the invitation is for, for parents and grandparents to just lighten up on themselves and just to focus on on what's working and what's good, not what's missing in your child or what you still need to teach them or, you know, all of those things are, there are moments where you miss connection. When you're in teaching mode, you're not connecting. When you're in, you know, practical mode, you're not connecting. And I think so many of us, we go into practical mode and transportation mode and cooking mode. Right. You know, and I'm a big believer, like, Kids are yearning just for really pure and simple connection. They just want to know that you're there with them. Absolutely. Right and they... I'm, right, I'm right here. And in the middle of a tantrum, Maria, sometimes I say, sweetie, I'm right here with you. I'm here if you need me. I don't run. I don't have it stopped. I, I'm right here. I can hear you. I can see you. Yep, I can feel that you're really upset and you're really uncomfortable. I'm right here. I'm not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's all they need, you know. It's just, yep, this is how their emotions are coming out. Right. And they should be free to express those emotions. You know, we were very lucky. You know, when I was growing up, and I have five sisters, uh, we were very lucky, even though, you know, it was the 1950s, 1960s, uh, that my father always allowed us freedom of emotion and freedom of expression. And my father was a very emotional man. And he wasn't afraid mm -hmm. to apologize if he did something mm -hmm. that, you know, hurt us mm -hmm. emotionally. Uh, but that was very rare in those days. Very rare. And you mentioned such an important skill, you know, I mean, there's what, uh, I think it's in the Being You book, there's the, the, the forgiveness, you know, life skill and I'm sorry, because 
you know, there's two aspects to it. Like we, we tend to want our child to apologize and say sorry. And, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily come from their choice. It comes because that's what's required and that's what they read on the parent or the grandparent or the teacher's face. But the, the sorry that we forget to teach our kids is the self-forgiveness, right? And, I mean, my work, I've done a lot of work with grown-ups that have never forgiven themselves for something or someone or some decision that they made. And, right. and I'm, I'm, I'm a real believer in, you know, how do you, how, how do you build a kind mind? And a kind mind, you know, we focus on kindness towards others and be kind to your sister and be kind to, you know, your friend. But what about the be kind to yourself message? Like most parents don't do that. They, they don't teach that to their kids. Really be kind to yourself. And when you hear a child, you know, when their inner voice starts going a little off, that's when you really need to step in with so much love and compassion and just, you know, teach them the power of their words and teach them the power of what they're saying to themselves. That, you know, every cell in their body is listening to them right now. Is, uh, is this what you want to tell yourself in your body? Right. So, so kindness towards others is great, and that's what parents and grandparents focus on. Kindness towards self that's revolutionary because a child who's kind towards himself or herself will not go be the bully, will not go be the one, you know, that, that doesn't really have care and concern for, for the planet or for their fellow beings because they're resting in kindness and love. They don't have to go be it or do it. Right, exactly. Well, you know, I did want to say this to, to the audience listening. Uh, I get a lot of books submitted to me. Uh, a lot of them are hard to read. A lot of them have bad, I hate to say it, bad fonts, uh, mm. bad artwork, uh, cheap covers. Uh, they're almost an immediate turnoff to me as soon as I see the size of the print, the, co the color, misprints, typos. Uh, but when I got these books, these I, I do want to say this, Ariane, because I think with all the interviews you get, people probably don't tell you this uh, about the actual construction of your book. Uh, the books are beautiful hardcover books with shiny, co with you know, very glossy covers. The artwork is adorable. The print mm. is big enough to teach your children how to read with these books. Yeah. Uh, and of course, you know, uh, they're just the message is fabulous. Mm. And for me, this is a very unusual thing because I, I did talk to you a little before the show that I've gotten so many terrible children's books that there's no way I would ever recommend them. Uh, but I'm very possessive about these mm. particular books. Mm. Uh, That's sweet. You know, it, it really it was a, a team effort because, you know, I've, I've written adult books before and then having had a child and then also just being around as many grown-ups, you know, I do one-on-one -on -one coaching, I do workshops, I do things for companies and, and all our wounds as grown-ups trace back to when we were kids mm -hmm. and so and I kept on you know hearing similar things or decisions that people made when they were very very young about what they were going to be and what was okay and what was okay for a girl and what success meant and mm -hmm. their bodies and were they good enough you know all that stuff gets informed and embedded in childhood and I thought wow you know like I can keep doing what I'm doing and I can also start a different type of conversation with parents, teachers, care, caregivers of any kind who are taking care of these kids just to make them more appreciative and sensitive to how we're actually coding our children and to prepare them in some ways. You know, everyone I've ever met always says they just want their kids to be happy. Exactly. And when I really, well, when I really push people, they really want their children to be successful and to be safe and to fit into a world and to get a good job and to go to college mm -hmm. and to maybe speak a language and do some sports and play music. Mm -hmm. I didn't hear happiness anywhere along there because right. when, I, when you really observe how people are with their children, you know, it, it is, and it comes from such a good place of I want to give everything to your child. Well, the, the giving is really, do they have to go to one of these you know, elite colleges? Do they have to kind of, get one or two or three different careers that you think is going to be safe and right for them. Um, that, that's where I like kind of, you know, inviting parents to sort of go, wow, how much of my time is actually spent on a happiness factor? Because, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, my story, 
is, is the classic example of my parents did the best they could. They sent me to great schools. I was highly educated, very fortunate, you know, and I did the sports and I did the language and, and I did everything my education told me to go after that would make me happy. And then I got to 30, very successful, big job in New York City, engaged to the wrong man. And I was like, I'm really far from being happy. Like, right. This whole thing I was promised, uh-huh. this is not it. And even though externally it appeared like, wow, she really has it made. I ticked off so many of these boxes. But, you know, there was like an emptiness. I was so disconnected from my own spirit. Mm. Right? Talking about spirit. Like no one had checked in. Well, what's, where's, where's Ariane in this? Right. right? And, so, and I was so terrified to be abandoned by the tribe. And the tribe was my parents. The tribe was the education system I'd been in, the religion I was brought up in. You know, the right. fear of abandonment of the tribe is one of the biggest fears ever. And so people will do anything to avoid it. They will marry the wrong person, and they will study a thing they don't want, and they will get like it's it's literally human nature. Right. So it does need to start very young. Where you know, one of the the life skills is yes, you can. Yes, you really can go write a book. Uh, I have you know, I have you, your book open to that exact page, by the you way. You know, you 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 have kids writing books at age ten now. Like no one's told them they can't. No one's told right. them they're not a writer. I right. was told I wasn't a writer. Wow. You know, it was a hard switch for me to go from corporate world, New York City, investments, you know, right. business to self-help, spiritual writer, coach, like that was an identity change that I didn't even know if I could make it because I thought I was going to disappoint so many people. Well, I'm sure you haven't, but it's interesting Uh, that you had that. I'm sure it's interesting you had that revelation when you were 30 uh, because I woke up on my 30th birthday with the same revelation. Mm -hmm. And I remember making a pronouncement to my husband at the time. I said, holy crap, I'm 30. I said, where's my life? And he said to me, what do you mean, where's your life? I said, I've lived 30 years for everybody else. My my mother, my father, my sister, my teachers, my bosses, my kids. I said, where's my life? And I I claimed my life that birthday and said I would never do anything I didn't want to do or be with anybody I didn't want to be with for the next 30 years. Mm. And I and stuck to it. You're a different person. I am a totally, when, me, a totally yeah. different person. <laughs> and what a gift to your children because, you know, what did children learn about work? Work sucks. Dad and mom are unhappy when they go to work, when they come back from work. Right. You know, work takes me away. Like, of course, these children, you know, whether you call them millennials now or whatever, have you, look at what you've been telling them about what work is. And then you expect them to go into that same environment. They're, they're dead against it. Absolutely. Listen, it's, you know, when you talk yeah. about, yes, I can. Okay, separate of thinking about Obama immediately in that second. Uh, I remember my youngest granddaughter, she's 21 now. Uh, when she was little, all she ever said, with anything we wanted her to do, whether it was getting in one of those jump houses or, you know, riding a bike or anything, she would always say, I can't, I can't. That was her thing. Oh. And every mm. time she said, I can't, I say, Jessica, you can. Yes, you can. Mm. And as she got older, she, she aspired to be a tattoo artist. For whatever reason, mm. this was what she wanted to do. She's a fabulous artist, but she couldn't handle art school. It was not the kind of art she wanted to do. Uh, and of course, everybody told her, you can't, you can't, you'll never be successful. Nobody makes money at this, that, you know, mm. all the people that like to tell you, you can't. Uh, I encouraged her continuously because I used to make my living as an artist. And I told her, if you're a good artist, people will pay and you can support yourself. I said, don't lose sight of your dream or you're going to be very unhappy the rest of your life. So she went through a grueling two-year, no-pay apprenticeship. And today she's working as a tattoo artist. So oh, Jessica her. found and, out that she can, she can. Uh, and, you know, bless, bless you, because there, there's an amazing book that I read that was one of the inspirations of, before I actually did this called The Spiritual Child. And um, it's a woman, she's a proper scientist, and she spent 30 years doing one of the longest studies of the impact of any form of spirituality on a child. Um, And she looked at a group of kids who had one and a group of kids who didn't. And by the end of 30 years, she said the kids who had had any influence from a grandparent to a teacher to an aunt to a a friend to a teacher, 
of any kind, from traditional religion to knowing about angels or seeing an altar or being told about compassion or generosity or working in a homeless shelter or soup kitchen, anything. These children were, you know, immune to bullying and depression and teenage suicide and pregnancy and drug. It's extraordinary. I mean, this should be, this should be, you know, front page of the media. Oh, I totally what it, agree. What it actually means because we're talking about, you know, depression and ADHD and bullying and teenage suicide. Like our, our minds are numb to the words and statistics. Like it doesn't even do anything to us anymore. And yet it truly is the reality out there. Yes, it it's is. Because we're raising, we're raising our kids to be perfect. And they're, they're sad, you know, and we're raising them to be not themselves meaning not a tattoo artist or not a yoga teacher and not a musician or whatever they want to be because the parents, instead of being parenting through love, are parenting through fear and security. Right. And the fear and security filter goes, are you kidding me? There's no way you could like, go into this world doing that. And so they put their fear, they put their concern. Your, your child is, it, you know, it, he or she will be able to make it with, with a cheering squad behind them. Absolutely. But sort of, you know, be their raving fan. Be their raving fan. I, I used to sit down and, and paint with her and draw with her and encourage mm. her. And I realized by the time she was around 13 that she was a way better artist than I was. And Maria, has she done a tattoo on you? No. She says, Grandma, everywhere you want a tattoo really hurts in that spot. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <laughs> and she knows I'm kind of chicken, but I figured no, sooner, you know, sooner or I mean, later. How many, how many kids did you give birth to? Uh, two. I had a girl and a boy. Yeah. See, if you gave birth, you can handle a tattoo. Well, I don't know. This is what my doctor always says. When I can't watch when they even take blood from my arm. He's like, did you oh. give birth? I said, yeah, but that's my blood. That's a whole different thing. Oh, <laughs> you know, oh, earlier you talked about happiness versus success. And I remember years ago, Bernie Siegel, and I'm sure you know who Dr. Bernie Siegel is. Yeah. He wrote a great book about raising kids, too. And when I had Bernie on the show, and, and for my new listeners, that's, that is still in the archives on site if you want to listen to it. His son was probably, you know, I don't know, in his 30s already. And his son said to Bernie, he said, Dad, I'll be happy when I'm successful. And wow. Bernie said to him, you'll be successful when you're happy. Yeah, and you know people yeah. have forgotten that you know it's it, it's our birthright to be happy. You know we either can choose to be happy on any given day or miserable. Mm -hmm. You know years ago oh, I, I used to lecture yeah. through the Southwest, and and before the audience came in, I would put a, up a big poster board with a little drawing, of course, and it would say, "Happy isn't just one of the seven dwarves." <laughs> oh, sweet. Uh, because I used yeah. to like to lecture on what makes you happy. You know, when's the last time you had fun? And for a lot of adults, they're so disconnected from that because they're, you know, their nose is to the grindstone every day. Mm. And it starts yeah. with you know, kids. I find it's, it's really been my journey in, in some ways in the last few years of just looking at, you know, do I have, most people talk about a glass ceiling. Oof, I think most people have a glass ceiling on happiness. It's like, I can't be this happy. I can't be more happy than this. I can't be more happy than my parents. I can't be happy if this thing is going on. You know, and I, I sort of question sort of the ability to, to, to be internally happy as opposed to externally happy. Because externally happy is, is a very risky place to be. Because every time you open your email or pick up your phone or, you know, something happens, then your external happiness is this constantly moving, changing thing. Right. And so, how do you how do you build up kids to be internally happy, whether their parents are getting divorced or whether something has happened at school where they they still feel full? Because my whole life was very externally driven. You know, I had mm. to perform, get good grades. I was an international swimmer. I, it's just it was all external. And the truth is, that stuff all goes away, every single one. And so, if you, if you put different parts of your happiness on any of those things. Or on especially someone else. Especially if they're people. Mm -hmm. You know, whoa, it's a, that makes your world very unsafe. You Absolutely. Know, there is a life skill called you are safe. And the whole you are safe is the world might feel and look like a crazy place, right? 
And kids see that. It's not like I'm protecting them or hiding them from the truth or the facts. Like that is very important for them to feel like this is the current world and you have, you know, an inner safety place mm -hmm. that is where they can choose to go. Because when when parents feel unsafe in the world, guess the message they're transmitting to their kids. Exactly. The same. It's Ooh. exactly the same. You know, when I was reading your books and, and I did sit down one whole afternoon, one after the other, I just was loving them. Uh, I used to have a great friend in New York, and she was a teacher, and she said the best way to learn about any new subject is to just read a children's book on it. Oh. So, so while I was reading your books, I thought about all the seniors out there, all the people getting ready to cross over. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought about seniors in nursing homes, seniors that have, you know, a starting, you know, dementia. Uh, and I said to myself, these are great books for seniors, too. <laughs> So, wow. so I don't know if anybody ever brought that to your attention, but, you know, no. reading them, I said, you know, there are a lot of people getting ready to cross over and they know it. Uh, yeah. And they might have forgotten their spirituality. They might have forgotten some of the wonderful things you write about in these books. Yeah. And I saw I it as a that. wonderful way for them to, you know, reconnect to that before they cross over. Mm. That's lovely. You know, one of the things that was, was my invitation was to try and language things in a way where anyone of any age could actually be reminded of it because this isn't about teaching it's really about remembering and about knowing like there's nothing new in here but it is it is under a lot of layers depending on the sort of childhood you had depending on the life environments you've grown up in your age and so what I have heard is that the, the people who read the books to the kids can feel very touched and moved because it hits a chord where it's like, you know, there's the, the very first um, poem in Being You is really about how love is not conditional on performance and academics and ex excellence and coming first and getting good grades and being mm. the most beautiful. And I can tell you, the majority of friends I know need that poem because they were not brought up that way. I was not brought up that way. Right. I was brought up where things were very conditional. And when I read the being you to the young kids in classrooms and libraries, I get very emotional still because this is it's very healing for me and for the little child in me that did not get that. You know? Exactly. And I think for, for people of any age, you know, the, the the there's one called Sad and Mad. And, you know, as adults we don't allow ourselves to be fully sad. We kind of put a stop on it, go to the gym, drink it, smoke it, eat it. But what this book allows kids to be fully sad, express it, find it in your body, speak to it, and be fully mad. Can you imagine like being given permission as a grown-up or a senior to be just mad? And there's so much power and grace in that. You know, someone told us it wasn't appropriate. We've been shutting it down for decades. And so you read it and you allow your child or your grandchild to do that. And there's like this, you can feel the floodgates of your own stuff just wanting to open. Exactly. Right? It doesn't take away the event. It doesn't mm -hmm. take away the person. But it does take away the bottling up of feelings that you've had, you know. Like I know so many grandparents who they might not see one of their grandkids or they might not see one of their kids or, you know, there's a lot of family drama that's there. Right. And so it's like how can... You know, the, the hope is that this reparents the person reading the book as well. You know, not only the children. I mean, sometimes I, I do think my son looks at me and goes, yeah, yeah, mommy, I know this one. I know this one. I know this one. I know this one too. And I'm like, oh, my God, these are all for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you have, uh, you talk about in the book, one. Uh, I, I, the one I happen to have in my hand right now is You Are Loved. Mm -hmm. uh, and... You have a chapter in here. I don't, I don't know if we can even call them chapters. Who are you? And, you yeah. know, I have asked that to so many people, even when I used to go out and, you know, hit the road and lecture. I remember being in front of a semi-wealthy audience in uh, Colorado one summer. And as they all filtered in, I looked at the audience and I opened up with, you know, I wanted them to introduce themselves to me. But the way I asked it was, who are you? Mm. And one person actually said, I'm the owner of a brand new Jaguar. <laughs> okay. <laughs> they identified themselves by what they owned or what they did. Mm. 
So I yep. immediately knew that none of them knew who they were or what they are. Yeah. And yeah. and then I you know you and then I, the second one was of course you know are you happy when's the last time you had any fun, the audience went totally silent they couldn't even mm-hmm. remember what fun was but mm-hmm. I can tell you this they were all bedeckled and speckled in all kinds of wealth you could smell it yeah, uh, yeah. but you have this little thing you know who are you and you, your first yeah. sentence is just wonderful you are pure magic pure delight all is well and true and right. I mean, you know, this is what our children need to know, that they're magnificent spiritual creatures having a human experience. I say it all the time. I say you're a magical child, you know. You can be and do anything you want. And the other thing that I really think is important is just to to have them here. Like, you know, I love spending time with you. I love being with you. I love being your mom. I love being your grandma. Like, I, I've never heard anyone say that to me oh, right? that's bad they, they spent time with me they provided for me they mm. they they did it you know it's there's no judgment to it but it's sort of like wow i, I missed you today or i love i love coming home to you and it's sort of these children realize that you know you're not sacrificing your whole life for them and i think a lot of children grow up thinking wow dad has to work so hard because of me you know right. or mom has to clean up the kitchen because of me and it's sort of that's the last thing they showed up on this planet for. You know, exactly. they, they, they showed up just to sort of be in some ways our teachers, remind us to kind of, you know, love and laugh and that it really is the simple, simple things. And it, it is a, it's a journey of unlearning and it's a journey of unparenting because the, the, the expectations around the word parent or grandparent or teacher are so high that we beat ourselves up and then we feel guilty and then we feel exhausted and I'm a bad parent or I didn't do this. Like, I'm not talking about any of that. I'm just talking about just create some space for yourself, for your child, and 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 then just water the seeds that are already there. Exactly. Don't, don't, don't let the, the weeds, because, you know, there are weeds, <laughs> and this world is going to plant some things over and above your child. And so they that's where they need to feel well you know, what, what tool belt do they have? My son, before he, he's in kindergarten now, and he literally has this little exercise every morning where he puts a, an invisible tool belt on that he knows he can go to. And, you know, sometimes he'll put different things in his tool belt, but there are ways that he knows he's got things to just go out into the world. Because what, one of the things I say a lot of people are like, oh, this is very spiritual. It's not very grounded in reality. And I, I always say, you know, my, my hope for any child is for them to have a foot in both worlds. They must be able to function in this world. And if this world is screens and technology, well, then I'm all for it because they have to be able to function in the world where that's where they're going to be asked to learn or do their homework on. Or It doesn't mean you need to put them there for distraction and entertainment. Exactly. But if they need to be functional in this current world, meaning teach them how to be an entrepreneur, teach them how to make money, teach them how to learn online, if that's more of where the world is going to. And they need to be very much in the world of their inner life where they have an intuition. They get to make their own decisions. They're not only all going to be imposed on them. You know, an intuition is not a skill that parents ever teach their children. Right. Most, most parents have never mentioned the word to their kids. Right. And yet, you know, parents parents know what a gut feel is like you know you talk mm-hmm. to people who got divorced and people go i knew it when i was walking down the aisle exactly teach, teach that to your children <laughs> teach that exactly. imagine what you're going to help and prevent or i knew i was studying the wrong thing or, right. i knew i shouldn't have taken that job or that publisher or made that investment it's like that's the knowing with a k okay so get that into your child age three four five six seven and imagine the life they're going to have when they check in with their own sense of self not a parent, not a grown-up, not, not someone else who's going to make a decision for them, where they're self-directed, self-empowered. Right. Ariane, we need to take a short break, so stay with us. Ariane and I will be right back. <laughs> 